Amen. So that was just like a little intro. But my family has been, I just wanted to give you a backstory because so oftentimes I don't get to talk to all of you and I just want to be real. You know, like we're on this journey, we're focusing on Jesus and so I just wanted, this is kind of what the Lord's been teaching me this past year. Um, but we are in the, uh, just the end of soccer season with our kids. We have three children. Uh, we have a six-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 13-year-old. And uh, they just got their last games and their little medals that they did not earn because everyone gets it. But whatever, they are proud of it. My 10-year-old son saves all of his medals. I'm telling you, it was amazing. And actually, he was in a basketball uh, tournament uh, like a couple months ago, and uh, they actually actually had a competition at the end. They did because it wasn't Parks and Rec, and so they actually did playoffs. And, um, and so they lost the first round, so they went to the loser bracket, and, uh, and they were playing the loser bracket championship, and Jude's team won. And can I tell you, he was, like, so proud. He kept saying, this is the first medal I have ever really earned. You know what I'm saying? Winner of the loser bracket, but he earned it. You know what I'm saying? Um, but we have been in soccer season, and so tonight, or this morning, the title of my message is Lace Up Your Cleats or Put On Your Cleats and Follow Me. And we're going to focus on Jesus, but I'm going to just tell a quick soccer story. Um, so I have played sports my whole life. Anyone else play sports? Okay, just give me a little nod, a little wave. Anybody ever see or have a great coach? Great coaches, right? Anyone have a horrible coach? Yes. Right? Isn't it? We all laugh at that, right? Actually, I, when I played basketball for high school, we had this coach, and everyone just called him the Italian hothead, and uh, he was Coach V, and uh, he used to chuck chairs at us. You know, like, I mean, literally, parents came not to watch us play, but they came to be watched to watch our coach. Because he was crazy. You never knew what he was going to do. Um, Josie told me the other day that her coach was, you know, you know, all upset and trying to get her to do something. And I said, honey, he's just he's yelling because you're across the field. And she goes, no, I think he's upset with me. I said, honey, you don't know what upset is. I said, our coach would grab us by the shirt and shove us on the thing and say, get out there and play. I mean, literally, the man was crazy. It was not what, you know, the great coaches that we're going to talk about today. But we're going to talk about a coach that thoroughly impacted me, and I learned so much. And it was actually the first time I got invited to be an assistant coach, and that is for Jude's team when he was in first grade. Um, so it's very different, I learned very quickly. Uh, it's very different being a coach of a game than playing the game. Um, playing, you know, you can have a lot of opinions about your coaches, but until you do it, you just don't know how hard it is, you know. And coaching kindergarten and first graders is a whole nother ball game, okay? I just had no idea attention spans were this big. Teachers, you are amazing. I think you're awesome. Um, and so I came in there and I was excited because I'm going to be a coach, but I knew nothing about soccer because I played other sports. And, um, and so I looked at her and I said, I'll be the coach, but here's what I have to offer. I'm loud and I can give the momentum and the spirit for the team. That's all about it. That's all I got. I don't know anything about the rules, I can't figure out offsides, but I'm loud and I can bring team spirit all the way. And, um, and so she said, perfect, I just need an assistant coach, you do that and I'll do everything else. So this coach, her name was Miss Kim. She is my complete opposite. She's organized, she's soft-spoken, she's not in a rush to do anything at all. Like, she's just not moved by things. And so we get this whole group of kindergartners and first graders together for our first practice, and I am, like, appalled. Like, I mean, just sitting down to introduce ourselves went horrible because she's just so kind to every one of them. Like, what is your name? How old are you? I mean, the other kid over there is picking his nose. One's going to get a snack. I mean, no one's listening to that kid, and I'm just thinking, you should yell at them. You know what I'm saying? Like, raise your voice. And she just patiently went through, and she began to start off and tell them, this is going to be a great, a great season. You guys are all going to learn. We're going to grow as a team and as individuals. But here, first and foremost, you need to understand, I am your coach, Coach Kim, and this is our assistant coach, Coach Sarah. And she said, if we can listen and work together, this will be a great team. And I am thinking, I don't think we're going to win anything. 
And so we go through the first practice, and it's worse than what we even started off as, okay? I mean, there's kids chasing butterflies. There's kids rolling in the ground. There's kids just kicking the ball any way they want. And I am thinking, this has gone from bad to worse. We are not only going to lose every game, but we are no longer going to win, and I'm going to lose my mind. You know what I'm saying? But Coach Kim was so patient. She would get them lined up, and week after week, we would do these drills, the same drills, over and over and over again. And she was not moved whether kids were running or picking their nose or twirling or talking to a friend. She would just continually, repetitively, and kindly say, come, let's do this again, over and over and over again. Our first game was just the same. It was horrible. We lost, just so you know, in case you were wondering about this. Our first game, it was chaos. You know, the kids all follow each other. They all get into a clump, into a ball. And she's like, that's not what we talked about. We need to do stick with the basics. And, and I'm thinking, these kids don't know what the basics are. They don't listen, you know? Like, and she is just, I mean, I'm telling you, this woman is amazing. I don't even understand how she possesses it. But she continued on. I remember it was Jude's first or second game. He literally left the field and asked for a juice box. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was not real soccer. It was like crazy babysitting. But here's something that I learned during all of this. About the first four or five weeks, all we did was stick to the basics, just learning the fundamentals. My son just loves to run. He's like, I just want to win. I hate this. I hate the practice. And I kept saying, we got to trust your coach. We got to trust your coach got to trust your coach. This is more important. Mom doesn't know what she's doing anyways, so let's, let's trust the one that knows what she's doing. But he was frustrated because he just wanted to win. Jude is full of energy. He's aggressive. He just, he hates losing. And so he couldn't stand the fact that she kept wanting to go over the basics over and over and over again. And so I remember about the fourth or, I don't remember what week it was, but later on after she said, all right, I'm going to teach you positions. And all the kids are like, they have no idea what that means. So basically, she would put a spot on the ground and say, this is where you're allowed to go, and you can only go there. All right, they do it during practice, whatever. Next game, nobody does their positions. Everybody runs wherever they want to go. So she literally started pulling them out and saying, one by one, where are you allowed to run in the field? And she would not allow them to go to the other side. Well, this frustrated our son even more because he loves to run, and he was one of the fastest kids on the team, and Jude wanted to be everywhere that ball was. And now his coach is no longer allowing him to run the field back and forth. She kept saying, Jude, will you trust me? You do not have to wear yourself out. You have to play as a team. You'll actually do better if you stay in your position and just play here. I'm actually getting exhausted. Like, I was like, I just want to win. He can score. Can we just win one game? Why do we have to learn the basics and the plays? I'm very competitive. It almost ruined our date nights because of this team. I'm telling you, I would be so frustrated telling Ben, like, if they just ran faster, if they would just hustle a little bit more, then we could win. Like, I shouldn't be coaching Little League. But that's regardless. I was amazed because halfway through the season, something happened. Something happened because we had a coach that was willing to put in the time and put in the energy and the commitment to teach these kids the basics and be repetitive over and over and over again and then teach them how to play and where to play. And all of a sudden, we went from being one of the worst teams because we had the most little people to one of the teams that were competitive and we started winning games. It was unbelievable. Our little people, our little kindergartners were beating ki kids that were first graders. But it was because they were the only team in Parks and Rec in all five years that Judas played. He's only had one coach that has ever done this. All the teams in Parks and Rec, it was the only coach that said, we're not just here to, for fun, we're here to learn how to play. We're learn how to actually play as a team. We're learning the skills. I want this to take you to the next step. I don't want you just to enjoy yourself, but I want you to understand that hard work pays off, and it's worth it in the end. 
And these kids went from picking wildflowers and running in circles and running off the field for juice boxes to all of a sudden realizing we can win this game. And team momentum and unity started happening. And parents started getting excited. And these kids started to win. And I learned a really valuable lesson after serving with Coach Kim. Yes, sports are fun. And you want your kids to enjoy them. But some lessons that I learned from being underneath her was, number one, nothing happens quickly if you want it to be lasting. Sometimes it takes time for people to get it because we have to actually be in it and we have to have repetitiveness and we have to be able to move and function as a whole and there's a lot of other things going on. Number two, I learned that it's not always the most important to learn your cool position before you don't have your basics down. And number three, I learned that it's super important to know who your coach is. And here's why I'm talking about soccer this morning. Because everything that I learned within this soccer game, I believe completely matches our spiritual walk with Christ. So oftentimes, when we have an encounter with God, our lives are changed and we have an idea of who he is. We have this encounter with Jesus and it's amazing and it's supernatural. And all of a sudden, we have ideas of what our life is going to look like. And then when we step out into the field or we leave our church service or we leave our quiet time, we step into the real world and we're kind of like those kindergartners. Like, well, I think I thought I knew what I was doing, but uh, I just got distracted by that butterfly. Or I'm not quite sure actually how to flesh this out. And so this morning, I want to look at a passage of Scripture, and I'm not going to go long. I want to look at a passage of Scripture where Jesus coaches his disciples on real life. All right, are you guys with me? All right, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew 16, and we're going to start in verse 13, and we're going to read about 10 verses, all right? So I know it's a little long in reading. Hold on, you can do it. All right, Matthew 16, you can look up on the screen if you don't have it, starting in verse 13. And it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Verse 18. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you ask for, I'm sorry, whatever you ask for, uh, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Verse 20. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone what he was, I, I, I'm so sorry. Cedar Point is catching up with me, I'm sorry. <laughs> then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law, that he would be killed And on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. Verse 22. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human perspective and not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you want to be my followers, you must give up your own way and take up your cross and follow me. So this morning, I want to set this up because Jesus starts this passage of Scripture with the very thing that I started out earlier. is Jesus says, Who do you say that I am? And as we've been studying the life of Jesus, I hope that you've been getting to know who Jesus truly is a little bit more. 
because Jesus thinks it's important. Um, but this morning, from this passage of Scripture, I want to pull, he doesn't say I am a great coach, but I want to just kind of insert it, that Jesus is our great coach. He is the one that is telling us the plays, who knows this whole thing from beginning to end. He sees each and every one of you, and he truly is our great coach. And if you're taking notes with me this morning, I want to just give you four things that Jesus, our great coach, is doing for us as his players. And that is first, number one, Jesus, our great coach, is patient. Jesus, our great coach, is patient. Did you know that the Old Testament nine times repeats a quote from Numbers where God says that I am slow to anger and abounding in love? Nine times throughout the Old Testament, God is quoted as saying that he is not this judgmental, angry God, but he says, I am slow to to anger and abounding in love. As a parent, I have to remind myself of that daily. I am supposed to be slow to anger like God is with me and abounding in love. I love this passage of scripture because it represents the way Jesus lived his life. I want you to think about it for a minute. Jesus had already been doing miracles, signs, wonders. He'd already been teaching. The disciples had already been with him for quite some time. And so he didn't ask them at the very beginning when he invited them to follow. He didn't say, who do you say that I am? He invited people to follow him whether they believed who he was or not. Isn't that amazing? That God is so loving and so kind that he didn't care what you believed. All he knew was that if you would get in relationship with him, then the Holy Spirit would give you an opportunity to be revealed who Jesus was. Jesus is patient. He invited his disciples before they fully knew who he was just because they said yes to an invitation. You see, revelation is supernatural. And it happens throughout our journey with Jesus. Revelation is supernatural. Jesus said to Peter, you could not have known that I was the Messiah, the Son of God. My heavenly Father must have told you. Isn't it interesting Peter didn't have it in the beginning? Have you ever thought about that? Why didn't didn't they have this discussion beforehand? You know what? I think about Parks and Rec soccer. All those little people invited to play, they all had one thing in common. They said yes. They said yes to learn a game they don't even know if they're going to end up liking in four years. They said yes before they knew if they were going to be an all-star superstar. They said yes even before they fully knew their coach. And it's the same way as People that are searching and trying to figure out, what is God all about? Do I believe in him or not? Do do I follow this guy or not? Jesus was not concerned about how they started. Because he knew revelation is supernatural. It's not through our mind. Isn't that what Pastor talked about two weeks ago? It's not by our mind that we believe in Christ. It's in our spirit. But I have good news It doesn't matter where you're at on your faith journey. You might be at a negative 10, let's just say. At a negative 10. You're not even sure that you don't believe in anything. Maybe you're an atheist. Maybe you have children or neighbors who maybe they're like, I don't believe what you believe. And so they're maybe at a negative 10 spiritually. And let's just for a visual think that maybe one is when you've had that revelation of Jesus, right? I have on the screen negative 10, negative 5, negative 1, 0, 1, and 5. This is just make-believe, but I just want to give you an idea because this is good news. So oftentimes, we only want people to experience that 0 to 1 conversion moment where they have this revelation like Peter did when they say, oh, my word, Jesus truly is the Son of God. And they have this moment where they make this choice. Yes, I believe. 
just like the thief on the cross, just like many of those. But can I remind you that so many of the people before they had that moment, it started with an invitation by somebody, by a human being to have a relationship, not to have a debate not to talk politics, not to talk theology, but how about you want to come over and have some dinner? Why don't you have a conversation? And so I want to encourage you this morning. If you are unsure what you believe, Jesus is not concerned about that. He says, just come. Learn more about me. Don't worry about where you're at. If you're in just close proximity, the Holy Spirit's going to open up your eyes to the things you don't understand. You don't have to worry about what you can't get yet. Some of you, you're praying for your children or your parents or your friends for that their eyes would be open. Can I encourage you that as you love them by the Holy Spirit, you can move them from a negative 10 because of your acts of kindness, because of your love in action, you can move them from a negative 10 to a negative 5? And maybe they have a divine appointment at a grocery store where someone says, Holy Spirit told me to pay for your groceries today. And that other person takes them from a negative five to a negative three. And then maybe they have a coworker at their work who is loving on them and been praying for them and speaking life over them and serving them. And all of a sudden, one day they say, why are, why are you different? And that coworker gets to share, it's because Jesus changed my life. And all of a sudden, they come to that place where they're now at a negative one or a zero. And they say, I'm no longer against this God. Maybe I want to be interested in learning about who he is. You see, it always starts with an invitation. And God demonstrated his love and his patience as the great coach to every one of us. And he invites us to do the same. But we have to remember the same way we started the race is the same way that we're going to continue to live this out. So oftentimes, we put pressure on ourselves to have all of the answers, to live a certain way. I need to be better than what I am. I've been serving Jesus for 20 plus years. I shouldn't be having doubts now. I'm a pastor, and I should, I'm questioning my prayer life. But the truth is, I have to remind myself, God says that he is slow to anger and abounding in love. And we serve a God who is not quick to say, you blew it. But he's quick to say, will you come towards me? And let's figure it out together. We have a great coach, and Jesus demonstrated that he is patient. People will never care about what we know or care about the life that we have until they know that we care. The greatest thing we can do to love those that are searching is not to cram doctrine or all of a sudden, oh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever lives, lives never. you know, I used to think that that's what I had to do. It's love. And then remembering that revelation comes by the Holy Spirit alone. That should be good news. That is good news because Jesus demonstrated that with the disciples over and over and over again. He would continually reveal the more that they walked with him, they learned who he was. They never knew he was the God that could speak to the wind and to the sea until all of a sudden it was revealed to them in the middle of their storm. They didn't know he was the God that could speak truth, that would change their lives, that it literally could become food to them. They didn't know he could do something with their financial needs and bring substance and make it in the natural. You see, our journey with God, it is supernatural, and then it's totally natural. God is completely, completely beyond just the supernatural. He's incredibly practical, too. And sometimes we have a hard time making those two things collide. But we see it in the way that Jesus lived. So number one, our great coach, he is patient. Know that God is patient and he is rooting for you. Number two, the second thing that I see in this passage of scripture is, Jesus, our great coach, knows that the basics are the most important. 
Jesus, our great coach, just like Kim, who with those kindergartners over and over again, doing the same thing over and over again, Jesus, in this passage of scripture, looks at the disciples who have already themselves cast out demons and healed the sick up to this point. They have not only watched Jesus do it, but they have also participated in it. We would call that mature believers. And I tell you, maturity has nothing to do with the glory that flows through you. Maturity has to do with, will you keep walking when you see nothing happening? What do you believe? And Jesus goes back to the basics with his disciples at the very beginning, and he says, all right, after all of this, after all the cool supernatural stuff, after all the amazing things that you've gotten to be a part of, I got one question for you. Who do you say that I am? You see, I believe Jesus was asking that question because Jesus understood, like any great coach, but he's the ultimate coach, is that our beliefs determine our reality. Our beliefs determine our reality. Case in point. This is ridiculous, but I'm just going to give you a case in point. When I was younger, I was taught how babies were made. Everyone? Okay? If you have children here, we'll just keep it at that. Okay? My parents did the little strict stick drawings. We were told. We were explained. Can I tell you that as a teenager? Now, I am blonde, so you're going to just have to deal with that. Okay? You're going to be like, what? I was told at a young age the responsible way that babies are made. As a teenager, I used to babysit and house sit and nanny for this neighbor lady. And she had a hot tub in her house. It was pretty sweet. And the older I got, she'd be like, oh, have friends over. Well, you know, the kids are sleeping, have friends over. And so I'd be like, okay. Well, this one time we had some guys over. It was totally legit. Don't worry about it. Um, we had some guys over and we were hanging out in the hot tub. Now, I need to preface this by saying the woman that I worked for was still searching for her faith. We'll say that. And she did not live the same way I did. We, I, she did not have the same views on sexuality that you wait until marriage and all that kind of stuff. And so it was kind of like a party hot tub, if you know what I mean. I'm just going to say it because we have children maybe. Um, it was a party hot tub. And so all of a sudden, I'm in there with my friends, guys and girls. We're sitting in this hot tub, and we're hanging out. And all of a sudden, I think to myself, oh, my gosh, I could get pregnant. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. The thought crosses my mind, I can get pregnant in this hot tub. And there's boys in this hot tub. And my mom and dad are not here to know that I'm not doing anything wrong. We're just sitting here in this hot tub hanging out. And all of a sudden, this incredible, ridiculous fear that I was going to get impregnated by it because there was a hot tub that people might have had sex in one day and sperm might be able to live in a hot tub and all of a sudden impregnate me. And I went to bed that night thinking I might be like the next Mary. My mom is never going to believe me. She's going to think I had sex when I didn't. All of a sudden, I'm going to be pregnant at 18 or 17. I don't know how old I was. But I'm truly, because I knew the basics, but I had never asked, how long can sperm swim in hot water? You don't think to ask those questions. Now, I know this is ridiculous, but I'm trying to give you a case in point. That is a ridiculous belief that I had. It was not rooted in truth. It was partial truth. I understood that you needed something and something else to make a baby. I didn't know the in-between parts because I had never asked about those things. There are many times in our faith journey that we do the same thing. We take a truth that God spoke and we begin to apply it to a situation that we're not, we don't know about it. And we start believing that. And then we start feeling anxious, confused, fearful, because all of a sudden we're believing something based on a half truth and we're applying it to our lives. Jesus, I believe, was looking at his disciples saying, more than you know I can do miracles. More than my great messages. More than me feeding your bellies and giving you identity. The most important thing you can do is know who I am. 
And he looks at Peter and Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, yes. And he says, Peter, that revelation is what you're going to need because you're going to hit a storm in a couple days. In this next season, it's not going to be my miracles that it's going to give you strength. It's not going to be the bread that I gave you a week ago that's going to give you strength. You're going to need to know who I am because your circumstances are going to start falling apart. You see, a great coach prepares his players for what is coming in the future. A great coach says, you got to know what you're believing because out of those beliefs come your faith and your life choices. You see, I believe Peter, the reason why he struggled and denied Christ that day around the campfire was not because he didn't have enough courage. Peter already showed us that he is a hothead. He makes decisions in the moment, and he has no control over his mouth. So I don't believe that he was having a problem with his speech at that moment. But what I do believe is that Peter was having a crisis of faith. Because maybe, just maybe, Peter, along with so many other good Jewish students, believed that Jesus was going to come and bring peace for the Jews. So many of the Jews, along with the prophecies, began to fill it in and interpret it through their circumstances. Even... Elizabeth's husband, who was a priest, who was John the Baptist's father, prophetically gave a word saying that when the Messiah comes, and we're not going to look at this passage of scripture, but I challenge you to go back and look at it. He says, when the Messiah comes, no longer will the Jews be hated. Has that ever happened yet? And as I was reading that prophetic word that's in the word of God, So it's true. I began to think, was this priest, who was the uncle of Jesus, whose son was declaring he was the Messiah, was this man disappointed with Jesus in the end? Because he might have interpreted that prophetic word that it was for the here and now. How oftentimes do we take scriptures and we make them apply to our lives even when the Holy Spirit's saying that's not actually accurate? Or do we take a prophetic word and we stand on it like it is God's truth and we think we know the time and the season and the hour and so we begin to declare it and all that it does is bring confusion and disappointment when it does not happen. We desperately need the prophetic. We desperately need direction to pray, but the prophetic is to build up and encourage the church. It is supposed to give us direction for hope, but our faith cannot be in the prophetic word in our understanding. Because you know what? Zechariah was true. He was completely right. Israel is going to have a day where they're no longer hated and their enemies are no longer going to do anything. And that is day is, is, in, is, in, uh, is in eternity. And their greatest oppressor, which they, so many of us do not understand, was actually their sinful nature. And Jesus said, I came to liberate that. But so many of the Jews, and I'd say so many of us, interpret who Jesus is and his promises according to our circumstances instead of according to the man. And Jesus is saying, disciples, little soccer players, he's saying, your faith can't be rooted in the extra. It's extra, and it's awesome. But the extra is not always going to be there. Your foundation has got to be in who that I say that I am. And so I ask you this morning, who do you say that Jesus is? If you had to write it on a piece of paper, would your answers match what Jesus actually said about himself? Or do they match a song that you've been singing? You are my champion. Jesus actually never called himself the champion. That's a beautiful song that's supposed to inspire us to look to the cross 
because he saved us. So he is our champion. If you leave here going, well, Sarah said Jesus is our greatest coach, that's not in the Bible either. That is interpretation through the word of God. But I'm not standing on when I am feeling frustrated when I can't interpret it my life, when I can't figure out why God's not answering my prayers, why my circumstances aren't changing. I'm not standing on the fact that God's my greatest coach. I'm going back to the word of God and saying he said he's my shepherd and he would never leave me nor forsake me. I'm going to go back to the fact that even if my life falls apart, my faith is rooted in a man named Jesus who walked this face of this earth, who died on a cross and rose again and said, if I have faith in him, then that is what I need. That, Jesus was saying, Peter, that revelation didn't come from just, just something in your mind. The Holy Spirit did it. But here's the thing with revelation. Revelation. Revelation is always tested so that it can become truth. Revelation, if it's not tested, it's like a seed that just falls on the ground and isn't actually planted in the soil. There is so much revelation. We live in the most blessed. Oh, we have the Holy Spirit. And we receive so much revelation. We receive so much from the Lord that we can become sidetracked by what is most important. Jesus did not ask them, do you know how to do signs and wonders? It is so important. He demonstrated it. He lived it. But he knew at the end of the day, as children of God, we have got to go back to the basics. Whatever you're facing in your life, can I remind you? Jesus is asking, who do you say that I am? And whether you can answer the question about your circumstance, still the greatest question of your life is, are you following him? Are you learning who Jesus is? Because if you will follow him, he will walk you through your circumstances. Jesus is our great coach. And he's asking that we will remind, uh, remind ourselves to keep our attention on, he, on him so that the rest can fall into place. Number three, Jesus, number three, the third thing I see in this passage of scripture is Jesus affirmed the individual as part of a whole. Jesus affirmed the individual as a part of a whole. And uh, this is one of my favorite things that just like made me like, what? Okay, so I love teaching on beloved identity because I think it is life-changing. After salvation, I think beloved identity, knowing what God says about you and who you are, I mean, that just transforms your life. Like God says, before the beginning of time, he loved you. He knew you. He predestined you, every one of you. Those of you that are watching live stream, every one of us were called to be sons and daughters of God. That's amazing. Okay, but this is the second part that I just, I think I've missed for so long. And it says that Jesus, when Peter had this revelation in the scripture, it says that Jesus says that revelation came from by the Holy Spirit, by my father. And he says, I'm now going to call you Peter, which means rock. In the Greek word, it's Petros. And the definition of the word Petros means it's like a stone. It's like a, a small stone that you can throw. It's still a rock, but it's a smaller rock. It's a, a rock that can be moved. But he says, as he continues the scripture, he says, you are going to become Peter, meaning rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church. The second word rock there is actually the Greek word for Petra. And it means massive rock, like a cliff, an immovable boulder. What Jesus is saying here, this is so cool. He says, Peter, I see you as an individual. And I'm going to bestow beloved identity on you. And I'm telling you, you are a rock. You are part of me. You are a rock man, so to speak, a stone man. You are, you are my representation. And he gave him identity. He spoke truth. Every single one of us in this room, God has a beloved identity for every one of you. And it's unique, 
and it's who you are. It's partly what you're created to do, to bring glory to the Father. And it's, oh, it is the most beautiful thing when you know what God thinks about you. One of the fun things about coaching soccer was that Ben would nickname all the kids. He nicknamed them all. And can I tell you, along with the basics, along with learning to work as a team, the other side that brought the fun and the unity was them actually owning their nickname. Jude was the hustler. And man, when we would yell, come on, hustler, I mean, there was something inside of him that was like, my dad says I'm the hustler, so I'm going to hustle, right? And we would name all of these little kids. And I remember this one kid, he would always pretend to be a robot on the field. And uh, like he literally would be like, I am a robot. And I'd be like, run, robot, run. You know, like robots are supposed to run. You know, because in the beginning, I would just try to tell him to run. He didn't care. But if you called him robot, he would run. Because there's something when somebody sees you as an individual, and they say, you're awesome, and I believe in you. You can do this. Can I tell you that our great coach sees every single one of us? He sees right where you're at, right at your faith level, on your faith journey. He doesn't care if you're at a negative two. He doesn't care if you're at a three or a four. He says, come follow me, and I have a special name for you because I love you, and you are part of me, and you're following with me, and so I want you to know that you are my beloved. But something else that is so beautiful, he says right on the heels of that, and this is what I was challenged with. He said, not only... Do I love robot? And not only do I love the hustler, he says, Peter, I'm going to build my church upon the rock. The rock is the revelation of Jesus. It is the truth that actually we actually are not all separate. Our identities, our beloved identities, aren't supposed to make us unique and special and separate. It's actually supposed to be a part of Christ. And when we all take our individualness and we all actually get into unity and in Christ Jesus, and our foundation is not on our doctrine and the things that we don't understand about the Holy Spirit or times and seasons, when our doctrine stays with who is Jesus, that is when we actually bestow the most beloved identity that there ever could be. That is when the world will see Jesus. He says they will know that you are Christians not by your faith in good works, but by your love. Jesus was saying, disciples, it's not about you as individuals. Don't forget this when you're going to start healing the blind. Don't forget this when you're going to, uh, people are going to start following you. It's not about your giftings. It's not about what you do as individuals. It's about being a team. It's about being a one in Christ Jesus, because our strength, oh, somebody's fighting. <laughs> somebody didn't want to be in Christ this week. They're like, nope, I want to be special. I keep seeing this picture, and I don't know if someone is struggling right now because they feel like God can't use them. Or maybe your giftings and anointings haven't been recognized and you feel like you've been passed over. Or you compare yourself to someone else. This is what Jesus says. We're all needed. We're all needed. Everyone who says yes, that is what makes up this team. But we can't just say yes to our beloved identity as an individual. We have to say yes to staying in Christ saying yes to being united with one another. Paul says, will you fight for the unity? Not for position, not for a name. Because he said, Jesus said, the greatest of you is actually the one that's going to be the least. If we would be the body and all function in our giftings and our abilities, there would be no lack. But we have to say yes to the identity that we have in Christ Jesus as a whole. 
The world is not just about us. Our lives are not just about us. Sometimes maybe God isn't answering your prayers because your unanswered prayer is actually going to have an impact 20 years from now for the kingdom because he's going to answer it then. Isn't that what he did with Elizabeth and Mary? Elizabeth was barren until her old age, and yet she did not have a child until God said, this is the time because I need you to be a prophetic example to a young girl who's going to be carrying the Messiah. That's why we cannot interpret interpret our circumstances through time. We cannot interpret what God says and what he promises through our small lens because when God says it, it is true. We have to trust. And this is my last point, and I'm ending with this. The last thing that I see in this passage of Scripture is a great coach focuses on the whole game and the whole season, not just on one play. You see, Jesus prophetically tells his guy, or not prophetically, he says he plainly tells his disciples what's going to happen next. He tells his disciples, guys, I'm going to die. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to suffer. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And I think this is utterly amazing. No one was like, woohoo, you're going to rise from the dead. Isn't that what we all get excited about when we sing these songs? As soon as it gets to like, and Jesus rose, we're like, right? Not one person. It's like silence, and then there's Peter. Again, he does not have self-control. That's why I believe he didn't have a problem with his mouth. Peter, when Jesus tells him that he's going to die and he's going to suffer, Peter does not say, thanks for sharing this. Can you explain to us more what's going to take place? How should we respond? No, right? Because we don't do that when God gives us words. That would just be too studious of us. We're like, I'm going to interpret this immediately according to my feelings and my thoughts right now. And isn't that what we see Peter do? Peter responds immediately out of the now, out of his feelings, out of his fears, out of everything that he's probably given up to follow this guy. And he goes, oh, that can never happen to you. Oh, my word. That's me every day. Right? How many times do we respond, amazing, have amazing revelation, the Lord speaks to you in your prayer time, you get a revelation of the word, and you're like, oh, God, you're so good, you're so faithful. We walk out the door, and a phone call hap- of rings or circumstances, we watch something on the news, and all of a sudden, the faith that we had one minute ago is gone. And now we're reacting completely out of emotions and feelings and thoughts. We're going back to our hard wiring. Oh, you're not faithful. I got to take care of this situation. That is my greatest struggle in life. My theme verse for my life is just the simple trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you what path to take. Peter is saying, no way. You just said I'm special. You gave me beloved identity. And so now I'm going to tell you, you are wrong. Right? But can I tell us, we can have revelation of Jesus' identity. We can have been given the greatest gift, but still not understand Jesus' will. I'm going to say it one more time. We can have revelation of Jesus' identity and yet still not understand his will. Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things not from the devil's point of view. What does he say? But from man's perspective rather than God's. Satan doesn't have to get us to think satanic thoughts to bring destruction in our lives. All he has to do is to keep us thinking in the natural. And we put ourselves in a box. And we begin to create little Ishmaels in our lives like Abraham and Sarah did because they're trying to make happen what God promised in their timing and in their way. How many times in life, because we don't ask the Lord, God, I feel like this is what you're showing me. What do I do with this? I feel like you're giving me this prophetic word. 
I will wait for the interpretation before I just jump ahead and do with it. You see, I believe all the disciples probably had that revelation. I don't think Peter just alone had it. Peter's just the one that spoke up. But I think that we get to learn a really beautiful picture here. Because Jesus looks at Peter, and out of his patience, and out of his kindness, he has this coaching moment with him. And he says, Peter, this is how he ends it. He says, Peter, the greatest thing you can do is pick up your cross and follow me. What I believe Jesus was saying there, it wasn't necessarily him saying you're going to die on a cross, which Peter did. But what I believe in this moment, what, Peter, what Jesus was actually as a coach saying was, Peter, you need to decide who's the coach of your life. I believe the cross in this context goes down to authority. Because one of the greatest crosses, more than dying a physical death, is every day we have to decide who is the coach of our lives. Who is calling the shots? Are we still in control? Are we still making decisions from our own thinking, from our, what seems good, what seems right? I think that actually is what got Eve into trouble in the beginning. Or are we going to submit our will to our ultimate coach and say, not my will, but your will be done? Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciples, you've got to pick up your cross and follow me. You have to lay down your ways of doing things, your striving, your thinking, and you've got to say, I can't figure it out, so will you lead me? I believe that's what Jesus was asking his disciples. Who is your coach? And are your cleats on and are you ready to follow him? And so that's what I ask you this morning. Who is the coach of your life? Who is the coach of your thought life? Where you set your attention? Jesus knew the disciples were going to be tested. He left them totally prepared. Because even after Peter thought like a man, had to be rebuked, ultimately denied Christ three times, Jesus patiently came back. Came back and said, do you love me? Came back and said, you're still on this team. Come on, Peter. Who do you say that I am? And he looked at his disciples before he ultimately left, and he said, I'm leaving you. But it's better that I'm not here in the flesh anymore because I'm going to send the advocate, the great helper, who is going to lead you every moment of every day. And that is the Holy Spirit. We are on the greatest team with a coach who knows the beginning and the end of our story as an individual, our story as a whole, our story for all eternity. And Jesus is saying, the question you have to ask yourself this morning is, who is your coach? Who do you say that I am? And does it line up with truth? Because I've realized I've prayed for a lot of things and I've been angry with God about a lot of things that he actually never promised me. But I took promises and I applied them to my lives and it wasn't necessarily what he said to me, but how I interpreted them. God wants us to finish this race. His desire is that we will at the very end, he'll be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because through the disappointments, through the confusion, through the times and seasons, you kept your cleats on and you kept following your coach. So this morning, I want to close with these three questions. Number one, who is the coach of your life currently? Not who was your coach yesterday, or last week, or when you were a kid, right now. Is it you? 
Is it what you're watching or listening to? Or is it him? Number two, what is the biggest challenge that you are currently facing? And how are you willing or how are you able to start getting God's thoughts, God's perspective on that situation instead of just thinking merely in your natural thinking? Let me rephrase that. How can you stir your thinking to think God's thoughts instead of man's thoughts? In that biggest challenge, God's desire is that you know you don't have to do it alone. The reason why he doesn't want you thinking your own thoughts is because it puts all the pressure on you. A team is a partnership. The coach is there to give you the skills that you need, to speak life into you, to give you direction so that you can get the job done. And just like our kindergarten team turned into something amazing, that is just a tiny little silly picture of what God sees about every one of our lives and all of our stories and all of eternity because he's already made the end happen. He's already finished the story. So he says, will you come on? Will you put your spiritual cleats on, so to speak? Will you set your eyes back on your coach, back on the one thing that you can truly set your life upon? And I'll answer some of your questions on the way. And some, you'll just have to trust me. Because Peter didn't understand this one thing. If Jesus would have done what Peter wanted him to do and set up his kingdom on earth, it would have saved them sorrow in the present, but it would have been disastrous for the rest of eternity. There are some things that we will not understand why God does not answer our prayers. There are some things that we will not have answers for, and we're going to have to trust him as our coach, that he knows the big picture, and we surrender our will and say, you're take the lead.